Hello, and welcome to BCD 235, Fire Protection During Construction. This program is being sponsored by the Coalition for Construction Fire Safety. It's being presented by the International Code Council and National Fire Protection Association. It is being hosted by the American Wood Council, and we appreciate their hosting and sponsoring this particular program. Copies of the recorded webinar will be available within a week on the American Wood Council site at www.awc.org. The American Wood Council is a registered provider with the American Institute of Architects Continuing Education Systems, provider number 5011237. The Coalition for Construction Fire Safety is a relatively new organization. It's a group of global organizations that are interested in reducing the number the frequency and severity of unwanted fires that occur in properties under construction, alteration, or demolition. You can find more information and helpful tools at the Construction Fire Safety Practices website located at the bottom of your screen. Current members of the Construction for Coalition for Construction Fire Safety are the American Wood Council, the International Code Council, the National Fire Protection Association, and the National Fire Sprinkler Association. If you or your organization would like to become part of the coalition, please contact Mr. Ken Bland at the American Wood Council, and his email address is also at the bottom of the screen. Today, this 90-minute webinar will introduce you to recent major fires and some of their causes, the many fire-related hazards that exist on a construction site, the ICC and NFPA requirements for fire protection safeguards during construction, and solutions for developing simple fire safety strategies. There will also be information on current building materials and construction industry efforts to reduce fire losses at the end of the program. Again, here are your presenters. I'm Rob Neal, Government Relations Vice President for National Fire Service Activities at the ICC. And Mr. Guy Colon and Mr. Alan Fraser from NFPA will be presenting shortly. So let's start with a polling question. Please respond to this first question. What is your profession? We'll take a few minutes to collect and review the results. All right, here we go. Um, remember to vote in the blue poll box. All right, not in the chat box or the question box, excuse me. Vote in the blue box. So, all right. And as usual, I give you about 30 seconds and, and until about at least 80% of you have voted. So. Please remember to vote in the blue poll box. All right, so it's been about 30 seconds, and I'm going to go ahead and close. All right, so we have about 40, boy, even split, about 41% um, designer engineering professional, 41% code officials, 12% other, and 5% contractor, 1% project developer. So welcome to all of you. We're so glad that you are here. And back to you, Rob. Thank you, Marcy. Upon completing this webinar today, you'll be able to do the following things. You'll be able to identify recent major fires and their reported causes. You'll be able to identify the I-Code regulations and their linkage to NFPA 241 for fire safety during building construction, alteration, and demolitions. You'll be able to develop a model fire plan for buildings under construction, alteration, or demolition. And you'll be able to identify existing building materials and construction industry resources for training, education, and mitigation. Now it's time for our second polling question. This is primarily for code officials, but anyone can respond. In the last 12 months, how many reported fires have occurred in your jurisdiction in buildings under construction?
Marcy, I think you're muted, but it uh, looks like oh, the results here are... Go ahead. Go ahead and share the results. All right. Sorry. Five or fifty percent have had no reported fires. Forty-one percent one to five, six percent five to ten, and then just two percent um, higher than that. So, all right, Rob. Thank you again, Marcy. Now let's see what else happens in this. In the last 12 months, how many unreported fires do you suspect have occurred in your jurisdiction in buildings under construction? Oh. Sorry about that. I haven't queued the next one. There we go. The... There we go. Unreported fires. Very interesting results. So, and a good, again, thank you so much for your participation. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close. All right, so we've got 44% say 1 to 5, 34% say 0, 14% 5 to 10, and then 6% more than 20, 3% 10 to 20. So, all right, I'm going to go ahead and close that and turn it back to you, Rob. Thanks again, Marcy. So let's talk about some of the significant fires that have occurred under construction. While these have been newsworthy and re occurred recently, the phenomenon is not new. Many of these fires have had social and economic consequences well beyond the fires themselves. So let's take a look at our recent history for the last four years of some fires in the United States and throughout the world. We hope you will consider how fires like these might affect your community infrastructure and the bottom line. In Portland, Oregon on August 8, 2013, 46 units in a five-story wood frame pedestal building were burned. The fire was reported at 4 o'clock in the morning, and the flames were reported to be twice the building's height. The intense heat melted the bodies of parked cars and plastic recycling bins, and flames singed nearby trees. The fire spread to two or three nearby buildings, and residents from between six and ten homes were evacuated and loaded onto public buses for evacuation. The Portland Fire Bureau reported that at the height of the fire, 135 firefighters and five ladder trucks each delivered between 1,200 and 2,000 gallons of water on a minute to control the fire. The Portland Water Department re estimated it took 1.35 million gallons of water to suppress it. The eventual loss was tallied at $4 million out of a $5 million project. As a result, the fire department now requires professional security services on wood frame construction sites. The cost for security is estimated at six to $10,000 per month. One contractor reported adding $20,000 in security costs to an $8 million project. This particular fire was determined to have been intentionally set. Now, in San Francisco on March 11th, in the Mission District, a six-story apartment building under construction suffered a $40 million loss that destroyed 172 units, injured several firefighters, and delayed the project more than a year. The contractor, the welding contractor who was on the job site, was held responsible for the fire and was fined $1,000 for a hot work violation. In Los Angeles in December of 2014, one of the largest structure fires in Los Angeles County history burned at a residential construction site in downtown LA, damaging nearby buildings and signs on the 101 freeway. Heat from the fire shattered more than 150 windows in the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power Headquarters building. Thick black smoke over the nearby 110 freeway, which was shut down for the morning drive, made Los Angeles' notorious traffic congestion even worse. A 58-year-old suspect in the fire pleaded no contest to arson and was sentenced to 15 years in prison for the fire at the Da Vinci apartment building. The fire was fueled by gasoline spread on the wood frame building's fourth floor. The judge who sentenced the arsonist said the fire could have burned down half of Los Angeles if it had moved to other buildings. It was very dangerous. In Chicago, July of 2016, 
The Chicago Fire Department responded to a fire in a high-rise building on the city's north side Lakeview neighborhood. The fire occurred about 2 in the afternoon when smoke was seen coming from the window on the 15th floor of this fire-resistive building. The fire was extinguished in about 20 minutes, while building occupants were required to remain in shelter within their units. Unfortunately, the fire's cause was not determined. Even buildings that will eventually qualify as fire-resistive when they are complete are vulnerable during construction. Flammable and combustible liquids, welding and cutting gases, combustible temporary shoring and forms, and accumulated waste all add fuel to unwanted fires. In Denver, smoke spread through the 13 stories of a building under construction in September of 2016. And in Miami, firefighters were called to extinguish a fire that began on the 68th floor of Miami's tallest building, which eventually became the 83-story apartment tower called the Panorama. Crews were taken to the 60th floor by construction workers and had to climb eight flights to reach the fire. Because a fire suppression system was already in place at the tower, firefighters were able to pump water up the standpipe to put the flames out. In New York City, the Langone Medical Center was threatened by a fire in December of 2016. The fire broke out on the rooftop. It was a result of a spark from cutting metal. Patients in the hospital were threatened by the fire and the smoke that was in the area. These fires are not limited to major urban areas. This fire in one of Seattle's northern suburbs destroyed a five-story building with 296 dwelling units that were intended for senior living. The fire was reported about 9.30 at night, and by the time crews, the building was fully involved. Firefighters were able to contain the fire in three and a half hours. The building was about 60% complete, but no fire-resistive barriers had yet been installed. More than 150 residents of two other nearby apartment buildings had to be evacuated, and an adjacent 36-unit apartment building was uninhabitable due to the smoke, fire, and water damage. A joint police fire investigation determined there was too much damage to determine a specific cause, but they had no reason to suspect foul play. The case is now officially closed. The famous fire in Maplewood, New Jersey on February 4th of 2017 was in a 235-unit complex. 30 of those units were due to be occupied within six weeks just, ahead of the, just after the fire. Fire required 24 fire companies with 124 firefighters from all over northern New Jersey. Firefighters were exposed to numerous hazards on the construction site, and one firefighter was injured. The cause is still under investigation. As a consequence of this fire, there's been newer, numerous bills introduced in the New Jersey legislature requiring construction materials and fire protection system changes to pedestal-style multifamily dwelling projects. Proposals have been submitted to the I-Codes to require sprinklers in the attic of this type of residential occupancy, or to make the attic out of entirely non-combustible construction, or to fill the attic with non-combustible insulation. In Raleigh, North Carolina, a huge fire destroyed a six- to seven-story apartment building that was also under construction on March 16th of 2017. The fire began shortly before 10 o'clock at a project called the Metropolitan Apartments. A downtown business owner described it as massive. It looked like the entire block was on fire. The fire forced the evacuation of nearby businesses and residential buildings, as requiring numerous roads to be closed, creating long-term traffic congestion during the subsequent investigation and cleanup. Eyewitnesses said it appeared the fire started on the second floor, but as early as April, they're still unable to determine a cause. As an interesting side note, the heat from the fire spread across the street and it offered and caused the fire sprinkler system in the North Carolina Fire Chiefs Association building to operate and water down many of their regular business records. As we get closer, now we start to talk about some of the international incidents. This problem is not unique to the United States. In Abu Dhabi, a fire began in a 28-story high-rise building that was under construction. And an adjacent hotel had to be evacuated as a precaution within 90 minutes of the fire breaking out in the middle of the day. There were 13 injuries, including 10 firefighters. Smoke damaged the top 20 floors. And the cause was undetermined, but the site had been criticized for poor housekeeping practices. In Dubai, fire occurred at 5.30 in the morning in a 72-story Fountain View residential building, sending thick smoke billowing over the heart of the city. Four construction workers had to be rescued. The fire started on a fifth-floor parking lot level and spread to at least the seventh floor. 
Interestingly enough, the site is next to the Dubai Mall and the 63-story address downtown Dubai Tower, which was heavily damaged in a fire two years earlier. Also, in this case, the fire was reported as accidental, but without any additional details. In the past few months, we've seen several major fires occurring here in the United States. On April 24th, 2017, in College Park, Maryland, home of the University of Maryland, more than 200 firefighters were called to battle a massive five-alarm fire. This was a seven-story mixed-use development of about 250 apartments and retail stores. It was one of the largest fire suppression efforts in Prince George's Maryland County history with an estimated loss of $39 million. The fire was reported to have started on the fifth floor and spread to the roof. The fire sprinkler system was installed but was not yet operational. As an inconvenience, the nearby University of Maryland had to cancel classes that day because rainy weather kept toxic smoke close to the ground. The fire forced the relocation of 68 residents of the senior, city, senior citizens building across the street. Residents of the Gladys Spellman House were relocated to College Park Community Center to avoid the smoke that filled their building. At one point, firefighters were pumping 10,000 gallons of water per minute with the weight of the water potentially causing a progressive floor-by-floor -floor collapse. The fire took exceedingly long to control because the only one ladder truck was able to get to the back of the building where the fire was located. The cause, likewise, is under investigation but is considered accidental. About two weeks ago, the builder obtained permits to raise the top five floors of the building that were constructed above the fire-resistive garage. In Overland Park, Kansas, March 21st, an eight-alarm fire at the Royal Apartments at City Place broke out at 3.30 in the afternoon. So there typically was little or no delay for firefighters to respond at this time of day. One building was destroyed by the fire in a matter of minutes, while another building was badly damaged. When the fire department arrived, multiple homes near the apartments were on fire. Fire crews said 25 homes were damaged by flames and smoke. Embers from the huge fire flew into the air, sparking more fires on roofs of several nearby homes. The fire started after a welding accident. The apartments still under construction burned to the ground. Another fire five weeks later in the Point Breeze neighborhood of Philadelphia. Eleven luxury homes under construction selling for about a half a million dollars each were destroyed. Two collapsed during the fire and two more were knocked down by the city for safety reasons. During the demolition, the, the developer had to be forcibly removed from the property because he was upset the way the city was knocking the project down and pleaded with the crews not to cause more damage than necessary. The developer was self-financing the project and reportedly had no insurance to cover the loss. Philadelphia fire investigators, with help from the Federal Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, determined that the fire cause was arson. In East Hollywood, California, on the 12th of June, fire was reported at 6 o'clock in the morning. Part of a three-story framing collapsed onto the ground. The neighboring home was damaged by the fire that generated heat enough that was intense enough to blow out windows, windows of a nearby apartment. Ten adults and ten children could not return to their homes. A person seen near the construction site was questioned and arrested for arson. He's being held on $75,000 bail. And in the last month, there were two significant fires that occurred in our area. On June 28th, in the Dorchester region of Boston, an 83-unit apartment caught fire. It was due for occupancy within 17 days. Supposedly, the fire department was on the scene at the time of the fire, investigating and checking the status of the fire protection systems, getting it ready for final inspection. But the sprinkler status was unknown, and its condition is under investigation. The six-alarm fire created a large-scale response and interrupted many of the traffic throughout the day. Of course, the fire remains under investigation. And finally, just a week or so ago in Oakland, California, the Waverly, which was a seven-story mixed-use project, caught fire in the middle of the morning and created a major fire in downtown Oakland. There was very concern for the firefighters because the construction crane at the site was exposed to the heat and was in danger of collapsing. In fact, the arm of the carrying itself was spinning around the column when the, uh, in the thermal column when the fire department arrived. A hundred neighbors had to be evacuated, and there was an open investigation to determine the cause of the fire. So let's talk a little bit about fire protection approaches to job site construction safety. 
And it's time for another polling question. Which of the following public safety officials has visited your construction site most recently, most often? Is it the neighborhood firefighters who are first to respond? Would it be a fire inspector, a building inspector, law enforcement, or someone else? About 10 more seconds. All right, I'm going to close it for you. So we've got about 70% say a building inspector, 18% fire inspector, 7% other, 4% neighborhood firefighters, and 1% law enforcement. All right, and back to you, Rob. Thank you, Marcy. There are five critical strategic elements successful to job site fire protection. The first is hazard awareness and mitigation planning. This includes conducting a thorough risk assessment of all the potential fire hazards and taking steps, including the development of a pre-incident fire response plan, to minimize the likelihood of a fire and mitigate its consequences if one should occur. Ignition prevention is the simple act of keeping fire sources, heating, cooking, smoking, or hot work, away from things that will burn. Later in this presentation, our NFPA speakers will describe their successful hot work control program that grew out of a tragic 2014 hot work fire that killed two Boston firefighters. Hazardous and combustible material controls. There's a huge variety of hazardous materials that appear on a job site from one time or another. Explosives, flammable and combustible fuels, glues and paints, lubricants, and other products. Combustible materials, framing and finished lumber, non-metallic plumbing materials, electrical wire sheathing, roofing materials, among others, should be arranged and stored so they do not accumulate on a job site, creating the opportunity for an accidental fire or a target for arson. Fire protection equipment access. In the event of a fire, there should be an adequate number of, and strategically placed, portable fire extinguishers that they can be used while the fire remains small. It is essential all workers on a job site know where they are and how to use them. Finally, in the event of an unwanted fire, if growing beyond what the portable fire extinguishers can control, there must be a way to notify the local fire department to assure they have easy access to all portions of the job site and then adequate water fire protection or adequate fire protection water supply to control and suppress a fire. We will cover each of these approaches in more detail throughout the presentation. And now it's time for another poll. In your opinion, who is responsible for construction site fire safety? Is it the individual workers, the sub-trade contractors, the general contractor, the project owner, or none of the above? So it looks like the results are showing 61% general contractor, 21% individual workers, 15% project owner, and 1% and 2% for the other responses. So Rob, I think there's a right answer for this one.
And buddy, you're correct. The right answer is it belongs to the owner of the project. He or she is responsible for the fire safety. But the first part of any successful fire safety plan begins with a risk assessment. This is a very simple model of a risk assessment where the hazards at the left, the at risk assets in the middle, and the consequences are identified. And when you get your PDF copy of this presentation, you'll be able to copy it and use it at your own leisure. Many of these items are intuitive. Developers, contractors, investors, and code officials deal with them on a regular basis. But the advantage to the model is it puts down in black and white the hazards that are for it, faced and can help form a mitigation strategy where it is most effective. For example, many construction sites have large fuel storage tanks for servicing heavy equipment. A spill or unwanted release, even without a fire, could affect people, property, both on the construction site and nearby, business operations, and the environment. The consequences might be property damage, property interruption, or environmental contamination. And given those potential consequences, the project manager can assess the risk. Is it better to remove the fuel tanks from the job site, provide secondary containment for the tanks, or have a third-party provider under contract to fuel the heavy equipment? Construction sites are rife with fire and safety hazards. Owners, contractors, workers all have to be alert to threats to, a safe and to maintain a safe and fire-free workplace. U.S. Occupational Safety and Health Administration requires all construction sites to have a site safety plan that includes at least a fire prevention element. Of course, life safety is a primary concern, assuring that workers and visitors can escape in a timely fashion. There should be a method of worker accountability, knowing who's on the job site at any particular time. There should be a method to notify workers in the event of a fire, whether it's a horn, a siren, or some other audible means that announces emergencies. When the construction or alteration is 50 feet or four stories above grade, at least one temporary lighted stairway must be provided for easy escape unless the permanent stairways are built as construction proceeds. Rallying points should be provided away from the building to account for all workers and to have them stay out of the fire department's way. Fire protection equipment in the form of portable fire extinguishers and adequate water supply, convenient access for the fire department and built-in fire protection systems, all play a role keeping unintended and unwanted fires under control and keeping them from spreading to nearby structures. The International Code Council publishes two documents that are applicable to this circumstance. The first is Chapter 33 of the International Building Code describes safeguards during construction. In addition to the traditional ones of pedestrian protection and, and uh, means of egress, Chapter 33 also requires fire extinguishers, standpipes, sprinklers, and fire protection water supplies. The International Fire Code, also in Chapter 33, which is adopted in 42 states, provides more detailed regulatory guidance on these areas associated with buildings under construction. Chapter, 40, chapter 33 in the IFC also says that, quote, compliance with NFPA 241 is required for items that may not be found within the fire code. Mr. Fraser will be talking about NFPA 241 later in the program. The scope of the International Fire Code covers construction, alteration, demolition, even those in underground locations. And of course, NFPA 281 compliance is required for those items that may not be mentioned within the IFC. NFPA 241 provides measures for preventing or minimizing fire damage to structures, also including those underground, construction, alteration, or demolition. So let's link back to that first po that first uh, poll, most recent poll. Into the International Fire Code, the owner is responsible for designating a fire prevention program superintendent. Now, the owner may retain that responsibility or may dedicate someone on the job site to do that. The Fire Prevention Program Superintendent has the authority to enforce the provisions of the fire code that are pertinent to construction sites, and if there's a security guard service, he or she is responsible for maintaining that. The program superintendent is responsible to develop a pre-fire planning program with the local fire service, responsible to train personnel and responsible personnel in the use of fire protection equipment such as portable fire extinguishers. The superintendent is required to supervise the hot work permit program. The supervisor is required to verify fire protection system devices and equipment are maintained and serviced. 
And finally, if a fire protection system is impaired, either whether it's broken or shut down for some particular reason, the fire prevention program superintendent is responsible for monitoring that to make certain that it gets back in service as quickly as it possibly can. All people on the job site, including visitors, should be aware of the importance of protecting combustible materials from unwanted ignitions. This includes building materials, construction waste, and other debris. A clean job site is less likely to have accidents, injuries, and fires. The fire code addresses these matters through common sense approaches to site maintenance. Combustible debris, rubbish, and waste should be removed from buildings at the end of each work shift. Where rubbish containers exceed 40 gallons capacity or used for temporary storage, they should have tight fitting and self-closing lids. These rubbish containers must be constructed entirely of metal or special plastics that if ignite, ignited, will not burn with great severity. The fire code prescribes specific burning characteristics for non-metal containers. Materials that are susceptible to spontaneous ignition, such as oily rags, must be stored in a listed disposal container. A listed container is one that has been identified by an independent testing laboratory as suitable for the purpose. Combustible debris, rubbish, and waste material may not be burned on a construction site unless the local code official has approved it. Combustible construction materials, including framing, shoring, and forms, should not be stored in or near structures. If they are ignited by accident or maliciousness, Materials stored away from the building are less likely to cause a fire to spread to the main structure. The materials in these photos are examples of vulnerabilities to both the adjacent building and the fire department's ability to find and operate a fire hydrant. A number of behaviors that occur on the job site can result in unwanted fires. The fire program supervisor must make it clear to all workers that carelessness is not acceptable. Open flame devices such as torches or heating appliances, careless smoking and discarded smoking materials, cooking and hot work are a few of the behaviors that the fire codes regulate. If smoking is permitted on the job site, the clearly marked designated smoking area should be provided. Mr. Colonna from NFPA will describe their successful hot work program later in this webinar. Temporary heating devices for drying joint compound, paint or simple worker comfort must be listed and labeled in accordance with the International Mechanical Code or the International Fuel Gas Code and used in accordance with the manufacturer's requirements. Oil-fueled heaters should only use an approved fuel such as kerosene or waste crankcase oil. The heater should be kept a minimum of 36 inches from all combustible materials unless otherwise specified by the manufacturer. The equipment or appliance must be allowed to cool before it is refueled. Liquefied petroleum gases in buildings undergoing renovation or construction have special rules because of LP gases' characteristics in storage and use. The liquefied gas is under pressure in storage, is heavier than air if it leaks from a container, and has a wide flammable range. The amount of LP gas is limited by NFPA 58. It is a mandatory reference found within the International Fire Code. Always refer to these codes for current and detailed requirements. If heaters are connected to an LP gas cylinder supplied by a single manifold on the same floor, the total water capacity of cylinders cannot exceed 735 pounds or about 300, 300 pounds of propane. If there's more than one such manifold, they must be separated from one another by at least 20 feet. Electric power must be recognized as a serious source of ignition as well as injury. Construction activities, moreover, are not routine or systematized. This affords many opportunities for the common errors that can lead to short circuits, ground faults, overloads, arcing faults, overheating, and electrocution. All work should be in accordance with NFPA 70, the National Electric Code. All equipment should be protected with suitable covers to prevent accidental contact with energized parts. And only authorized personnel should be permitted to remove covers and then only after the equipment has been de-energized. Motorized equipment includes not only that motor vehicles or off-road apparatus, but fixed equipment such as generators, pump drivers, and floor buffers. Many of these units generate enough heat to ignite combustibles. Fixed and placed equipment should be located so that hot exhaust pipes are not against combustible materials, and the exhaust should be piped to the outside of the building. Any motorized equipment should not be fuel refueled while it's in operation, and any fueling should be stored in an approved area outside of the building. 
Roofing operations are a common cause of fires in commercial and industrial projects, primarily because of the use of combustible products such as heated tar or asphalt, rubberized roofing membranes, and open flame torches. Careless use of these products and equipment is an invitation to a serious fire. To address the dangers associated with the roofing process, the fire codes provide very specific guidance. Asphalt kettles should not be fired or heated until they are in an approved location on the job site. The tar kettle should be at least 20 feet from any combustible material, any combustible building surface, or any building opening, and within a controlled area identified by the use of traffic cones, barriers, or other approved methods. Tar kettles and pots must not be used inside the building or on the roof of a building or a structure or block any means of egress, gates, roadways, or entrances. Fuel containers that are not part of the, the uh, trailer should be located at least 10 feet from the burner unless they are properly insulated from the heat of the flame. There should be a minimum 40 BC rated portable fire extinguisher within 25 feet of each tar kettle when it is operating, and at least one portable fire extinguisher with a minimum rating of 3A 40 BC on the roof when it is being covered. High boys, those small carts used to move asphalt on the roof, must be constructed of non-combustible materials and limited to a capacity of 55 gallons. Fuel sources or helium elements are not allowed as part of a high boy. Any operating kettle should be attended by at least one employee who is knowledgeable of the operation and the hazards. The employee must remain within 100 feet of the kettle and have the kettle within sight. Ladders or similar obstacles cannot be part of the route between the attendant and the kettle. Flammable and combustible liquids are pervasive on construction sites. Whether used as fuels, lubricants, paints, and other finishes, adhesives, cleaning solvents, or other applications, their propensity to spill and flow away from their containers creates a potential fire problem. The fire code provides detailed requirements for the storage, use, and handling of flammable and combustible liquids at construction sites. And a key to understanding the regulation is to know the difference between the highly volatile flammable liquids and generally, generally less dangerous combustible ones. The information for classification can be obtained from the product's safety data sheet, or the local fire or building code official can help categorize these products. In general, the fire code is more restrictive for flammable liquids, such as gasoline and some solvents, limiting their amount and use to lessen the likelihood of a problem. The general safety rules for flammable and combustible liquids include making sure there's plenty of ventilation in operations where these items are being used, keeping storage areas free of combustible vegetation and waste materials, assuring that ignition sources and smoking are not permitted near storage areas or where the materials are being used, and at the point of final use, having dangerous liquids in approved safety containers. Because flammable gases can travel long distance when they escape from their containers, meeting the fire code is particularly important. Ignition sources must be carefully watched. Any static producing equipment must be grounded. No smoking signs should be provided in both storage and use areas. Storage areas must be clean and free of combustible materials. Pressurized cylinders should be stored upright and secure so they will not fall over. And cylinders that are not being used should have protective caps over their valves. Flammable gases should not be used to clean or remove debris from piping that is open to the atmosphere. Cleaning and purging flammable gas pipe systems, including cleaning new or existing pipe systems, purging pipe systems into the service, and purging pipe systems out of service, must comply with an FPA 250, I'm sorry, two, NFPA 56, the standard for fire explosion prevention during cleaning and purging of flammable gas prevention system, or piping systems. Explosives and blasting agents often are used for site preparation and demolition. Because of their potential for destruction and deadly force, they are highly regulated by the fire code and other authorities. These authorities should be consulted before any blasting operations occur. In general, explosive materials should be stored, used, and handled in accordance with the detailed requirements found in the International Fire Code. Blasters should be qualified, unimpaired by alcohol or drugs, be at least 21 years old, and be able to demonstrate knowledge of safety procedures. They should be able to produce copies of their blaster's license, appropriate permits, and damage mitigation plans and certificates of insurance for any unanticipated events. During demolition using explosives or blasting agents, approved fire hoses must be maintained at the demolition site. The fire hoses must be connected to an approved water supply 
and be capable of being used on post-detonation fires anywhere on the operational site. If explosives are going to be stored on the construction or demolition site, they must be kept in approved temporary or portable magazines suitable for the type and quantity of explosives. If more than one magazine is used, they must be separated by distances specified in the fire code. Magazines must be locked to prevent unauthorized access, and suitable no smoking or open flame signs must be provided. If explosives are stored on site, warning signs must be posted at all fire department access points to warn firefighters of the potential danger. Although never wanted or expected, fires do occur on construction or remodeling sites. In those cases, prompt access to easy to use fire suppression equipment is essential. Portable fire extinguishers need to be provided at each stairway and at all floor levels where combustible materials have accumulated and in every storage and construction shed and where special hazards exist, including storage and flammable liquid, uh, storage and use of flammable and combustible liquids. As multi-story buildings rise out of the ground, the fire protection challenges increase. Temporary standpipes for fire departments may be required. Buildings that are required to have standpipes upon completion are required to have at least one standpipe for use during construction. The standpipe must be installed before construction rises more than 40 feet above the lowest level of fire department access. As construction progresses, the standpipe must be uh, extended to within one floor of the highest point that has secure decking or flooring. If a building being demolished has a standpipe, it must be maintained. In buildings where a sprinkler system is required by the building or fire code, any portion of the building or structure is not permitted until the sprinkler system has been approved and tested by the local fire official. Finally, if it becomes necessary to call the fire department, easy access and an adequate fire protection water supply will be needed to keep losses at a minimum. Equally important is calling the fire department of any construction site, no matter how small it may seem and whether it is believed to be out. The fire department will help assure that the fire is completely extinguished. In case the fire department has to respond, clearly marked and unobstructed access to the construction site is essential to maneuver large apparatus into positions where firefighting tactics can be employed most effectively. The fire code requires approved vehicle access to all construction or demolition sites, and it must be provided to within 100 feet of temporary or permanent fire department connections on standpipe or sprinkler systems. Access must be provided by temporary or permanent roads capable of supporting the loads of local fire apparatus. Fire protection water supplies are required by both the building and the fire code to be ready and in operation by the time combustible materials have accumulated on the job site. You may recall how some of the fires described in the first part of this webinar demanded millions of gallons of water to extinguish. Generally, this is much more than what would be required if the building is finished. Any fire protection systems that are impaired, the fire prevention Superintendent is responsible to make sure that they are tracked and put So Rob, I think we just lost your connection there. If you can still hear me. Um, I'm going to give you a couple seconds here to see if we can recover your audio, and then we may just jump to the next speaker. All right, so Marcy, a uh, little out of sync here, but let's go ahead. We're pretty close to where Rob was going to wrap up anyway. So let's uh, go ahead and transfer to the next speaker, and we'll work to get Rob's audio back for the Q&A session a little bit later. Sounds good. All right. Okay, here we go. Is that the right screen? Nope, you had the right one the first time. So let's. I did. Uh, Sorry, let let's, me try back at it. Uh, Marcy, let's try that again. 
Is there that the right one now? That's, the, that's it. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks for your help, Marcy and Buddy. Um, want to thank Rob for his uh, presentation. Uh, it's a pleasure for Alan and me to join with you for this webinar. In this next portion of the program, I'm going to review what NFPA has been doing since last fall when we began working with the Boston Fire Department to create a consistent level of awareness of the hazards of hot work among the construction trades working in the city of Boston. First, let's begin with a polling question. Absolutely. I'm sorry. I'm a little behind the, the game here. So, okay. All right. Which form of hot work below contributes most frequently to hot work caused fires in homes? Is that welding, hot riveting, grinding, soldering, drilling, and tapping? Which one of those is the correct answer? All right. And again, I give you usually about 30 to 40 seconds and about 80% voted. So right now I've got about 50% voted. So probably about 10 to 15 more seconds. And I'm unable to see how many people vote, but I can see the percentages. So. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close that. And let's see, we've got 45% say soldering, 30% say welding, 18% grinding, 6% drilling and tapping, and 1% hot riveting. So, um, Guy, I'm going to let you give the real answer. Absolutely. And um, in a moment, I'm going to talk a little bit about some statistics that NFPA have collected, um, and you'll find out that the answer is soldering. One of the reasons for uh, asking this question is um, related to the various audiences that we've been presenting to since we launched this program with Boston Fire Department in the city of Boston. Um, and that is that among one group of uh, trades who do a lot of soldering, um, there was certainly a belief before we began this program that um, soldering among the various types of hot work wasn't necessarily um, a significant contributor in terms of ignition potential. Um, however, the data show otherwise. So that's the purpose for um, highlighting that, and uh, we'll continue now. So thank you, Marcy. So um, as Buddy mentioned, I mean, as uh, Rob mentioned, um, unfortunately, we find ourselves in this um, activity as a result of a, of a loss. Um, Hot work contributes significantly as, ignition, as an ignition source when not correctly planned or managed. That lesson repeated itself March 26, 2014, when a hot work activity became the ignition source for what would become a nine alarm fire and would ultimately claim the lives of two of Boston's finest, Lieutenant Ed Walsh and firefighter Michael Kennedy. As they battled the fire located in a building adjacent to the Boston Esplanade and the Charles River, if you're familiar with watching maybe the Boston fireworks and the Boston Pops every 4th of July. Prudent action by the contractors that day would have resulted in possibly not performing the job with hot work as a 50, uh, 50 mile an hour wind was blowing unabated across the river to their location. The job had not received a permit from the city and no safeguards of the type required by NFPA 51B the NFPA hot work standard, OSHA regulations for general industry as well as construction, or the city fire prevention regulations were evident. With that as motivation, Boston Fire Department committed to changing the hot work practices employed within the city through regulation and training. As I mentioned, um, through the National Fire Incident Reporting System, or NFERS, database that NFPA manages, a recent update to our Hot Work Fires report, and you can uh, obtain this report by going to the NFPA webpage uh, and going to our research section. Um, report was released in September of last year, and it re reveals that U.S. fire departments responded to an average of 4,400 uh, 4, fires involving hot work annually. And that uh, is based on data for a period covering 2010 to 2014 or a five-year period. And one way to kind of put 
that number into perspective is if you just look at it from the standpoint of uh, being an annual number, if you divide 365 into 4,400, you get more than 10 a day. Um, so basically what we're looking at is, uh, along with the information presented by Rob on those uh, construction site fires that he documented, we're talking about hot work contributing to uh, something on the order of 10 fires a day all year long uh, throughout the United States. So certainly um, a significant activity in terms of ignition potential. Looking a bit more carefully at those numbers, we see welding involved in 34% of the hot work structure fires. And as I mentioned, soldering equipment is involved in 34% of the hot work fires in homes. Finally, 58% of hot work structure fires occurred in or on non-home properties. With the awareness training that NFPA has performed since last September, one aha moment that has resulted occurred with the plumbing, heating, and cooling contractors um, as I'm doing the presentations for them and share that data on soldering. For many of them in those trades, they didn't universally see their type of hot work as contributing significantly to these incidents. However, through this initiative, that awareness and safety culture is changing and they have become strongly supportive of this effort throughout Boston. So it was essential that we built this partnership. That partnership has been uh, with, N uh, with NFPA through the Boston Fire Department and the Boston Inspectional Services Division, which represents the building, the fire, and the electrical inspection team. They asked NFPA to assist in this effort starting back in summer of 2015. And um, we began developing a training outline with specific objectives and worked with both Boston Fire Department and the Inspectional Services Division staff to establish the training framework. And in order to more effectively reach all of the affected industries, the Boston Metro Building Trades Council joined the team and assisted in the final development of the training content and requested that it be presented as an instructor-led program. We have also developed an online module uh, that would be developed uh, presumably for future. Um, and this all happens in terms of effectiveness because the mayor of Boston signed an ordinance requiring this. So that ordinance uh, was issued June 2nd of 2016. Uh, the Boston Fire Department, a deputy chief, uh, who represents basically the fire marshal of the city of Boston, just made a presentation two weeks ago to the city council of Boston, updating them on the status of the program. And um, with that comes um, an update on terms of the enforcement that will go forward that I will uh, share at the close of my part of the presentation. This ordinance uh, amended the city's fire regulations regarding hot work procedures including the permit process and requiring all workers at construction sites in the city where hot work is involved to complete the NFPA training and obtain the hot work safety certificate. It also expands the definition of hot work beyond just welding and cutting because previously um, the city regulations mostly focused on welding, cutting, and grinding activities and would have eliminated things like soldering and brazing and grill, uh, drilling and grinding and things like that, or, or drilling and tapping rather, from uh, being involved in a hot work plan that the city would have overseen. So with that uh, ordinance comes that expanded definition to include uh, many of the more typical types of hot work. What are those types of hot work? This slide here is intended to show what we characteristically uh, would experience um, obviously, many of you would expect to see welding, cutting, and grinding, um, clearly soldering and brazing. Typically, soldering involves a lower temperature in terms of the um, connective material, uh, i.e. the solder, whereas brazing requires a little bit of uh, pre-treating often. Certainly, heat treating. We don't do much hot riveting in industry anymore, although that would have been included. Uh, but things like thawing pipe, drilling, and tapping. Um, construction sites where powder-driven fasteners, uh, such as the Hilti gun using the explosive charge, that is a hot work activity. And then Rob mentioned torch-applied roofing, and as Alan will share, uh, 
when he does his part of the presentation, you'll see that while torch applied roofing, as Rob said, and as you can clearly understand, is definitely a hot work activity. It has been, uh, in terms of specific safeguards and best practices, it is covered within NFPA 241 in terms of the construction, uh, alteration, uh, renovation, and, and demolition activities. And then there are other applications where anywhere you have either open flames, spark production, or heat production, those are all embedded in the definition of hot work. So um, as we finished the development and we got ready to move into last fall and launch this program, uh, it was again essential that we did it uh, collaboratively. So um, what NFPA did with the training once it was uh, completed in, in um, late 2015 and early 2016 is that we move forward in terms of planning how it would be executed. And the training was launched last September. And our role was to initially train uh, the union training staff so they could conduct the training within the various locals in the city. The Building Trades Council, as it notes there, uh, represents uh, a membership of about 14 different locals operating within the city. So we train their trainers, which was something initially on the order of about 120 trainers. And then they uh, implemented that training beginning in October of 2016 within their locals. The other thing we had to do, and this was where NFPA has had a more active role in terms of the training activity itself, um, was for those non-organized, non-union um, contractors and workers, we created what we've de designated as public courses to address their needs. Since October 2016, NFPA and the various unions have trained, as it says there, over 16,000. I actually just checked this morning, and the number is closer to 17,000. Representing steel workers, iron workers, sheet metal workers, electrical workers, carpenters, plumbers, and HVAC contractors. So we're hitting um, a wide segment of the industry within the city of Boston. As I mentioned, the hot work definition through the ordinance um, has been expanded to include all of those elements. So any one of those conditions um, constitutes a hot work type activity. Our approach for the training is intended to be simple and straightforward. It takes an approach starting with the hazard identification. And, and par as part of that, we share that not all types of hot work are equal in terms of their severity or hazard potential, but that all of them, if you don't take any of the safeguards, you don't um, do that assessment, you have the potential to contribute to an ignition scenario. So uh, we start with the hazard identification, which is what conditions characterize hot work and how do those conditions contribute to fires at the work site. And then we move to the definition and application of the various control um, or safeguarding measures. They can be administrative measures such as the permit process and the hot work safety team, also consistent job site planning, and then active steps to separate the ignition hazard, which is generally the hot work, um, from the fuels. And those fuels can be any number of things. They can be the building structure, they can be liquids or gases, and they can be just poor housekeeping, which is going to breed um, the simple combustible, such as paper, rags, trash and debris. In Boston, there are often two permits that issued by the city for a job site and that might be prepared by the general contractor uh, or the building owner or operator prior to the start of each hot work activity um, that serves to document those steps taken to identify and control hazards. And then there is what we have in terms of our uh, standard, which is uh, what we call an internal permit, which would be the actual contractor uh, pulling a permit or, or creating a permit, documenting everything before they start their job each day. So coupled with the city pull permit and the company specific permit or the internal permit, we believe we're strengthening um, that planning and execution that goes on in the city. And back to Rob's question earlier for all of you um, about whose responsibility is this, um, as far as hot work is concerned, both from Boston Fire Department as well as from NFPA, um, it's everyone's responsibility. Our message to the people attending our training is that anyone is responsible. If they see something that is unsafe, they need to bring it to uh, someone's attention. They need to stop the hot work. 
reevaluate those conditions, make corrections as necessary, and then resume the hot work process. This is just a uh, photo taken from a job site in the city to illustrate that um, there are challenges. Um, not all of them look like this within the city, but here you have uh, what appears to be a significant amount of combustible uh, materials. And if hot work were to be contemplated, this clearly would be a challenge in terms of planning and preparation and execution of that um, hot work job to ensure that everything went off safely. And in conclusion of my section, uh, from a what, what's next perspective, um, the Massachusetts governor has established a commission through the office of the state fire marshal uh, for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, so we believe at some point in time that the program that has been launched in the city of Boston will likely expand throughout the state. A number of Massachusetts communities have already expressed interest in similar program on their own. Um, so independent of what might happen through the state. Um, we are working with a number of organizations through for the training that we're doing for the city of Boston right now, such as the plumbing, heating, and cooling contractors, uh, the associated builders and contractors, the associated general contractors. Those folks have both uh, local presence but also national reach. And um, so we believe through them that this program might grow. And then there have been a number of other jurisdictions that have inquired through Boston Fire Department about the program. We have heard, for example, through from Nashville, Tennessee, New Brunswick, New Jersey, Seattle, San Francisco, as well as the Fire Department in New York uh, about trying to um, model uh, a program in their jurisdictions after what uh, the city of Boston and NFBA have put together. So um, thank you for your attention. That's my part. And uh, I'm going to pass you through, Marcy, to uh, my colleague, Alan Fraser, to talk specifically about NFPA 241. Thank you. All right, here we go. Over to Alan. Are we up, Marcy? I do believe. All right, thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Guy, great presentation. Excellent job, Rob. Good afternoon, folks. Society's had fires in buildings since we first started building them many, many, many years ago. Buildings in the course of construction have many additional fire hazards not found in completed structures. Fire protection equipment to restrict the spread of fire and extinguish it promptly has not yet been installed. And fires that occur in these buildings are often difficult to access by the fire department. NFPA 241 is a unique standard in that it is not a brick and mortar standard, but a standard about the process of putting the brick and mortar in place. Standard ceases to apply when the building is finished, i.e. when the CO is issued. So the work on this document started in 1930 after a decade of disastrous fires and constructions in New York. And it, the first edition was adopted in 1933 with some additions from the original version. A tentative revision was published in 1942 and tentative text in 1957. It was adopted again in 1958 and a complete revision adopted in 1973 and in 1968 and 1973. Editorial revisions in conformance with the NFPA manual style was done in 1975, and in 1980 it was reconfirmed. There was a complete rewrite in 1986, which included 20 references. And in 1989, we rewrote the roofing operations, appendix items on torch applied roofing, and a new chapter on underground structures. Reformatted in 93, in 96, in 2000, 2004, fire watch was added in 2009, and temporary heating equipment, fire safety program, and updated references for underground air quality were added in 2013. And this document has been in existence for 80 plus years. Why so many reformattings? 
Well, it's pretty simple, folks. It wasn't being followed. There was a concern that people didn't understand the way the document was written because we were still having a lot of construction fires. 1986 and 1896, NFPA was founded. We issued the National Electric Code in, 19, in 1897. First National Building Code was issued by the National Board of Fire Underwriters in 1905. 1913, what's now NFPA 101, the NFPA Building Exit Code was issued. In 1927, the Pacific Coast Building Officials Conference, Uniform Building Code, which is now part of ICC, was established. This is how far back 241 goes in the recognition of problems of fire in buildings under construction, 1933. Southern Building Code Congress came about in 1945, and in 1950, BOCA was established. Now, the potential for extensive damage during a fire event is greatest when a building is under construction because it is largely unprotected. Think about a mother gorilla and her infant. Massive, powerful animal. But gorillas remain with their mother until they're between four and, 16, four and six years old constantly. Much like the infant gorilla, a building under construction needs constant supervision and inspection. That is not possible or practical by municipal inspectors. There simply aren't enough man hours to go around. What's okay at 8 a.m. may have changed and no longer be okay by 5 p.m. that day or even by noontime. Buildings simply are not ready to protect themselves. Code required passive and active fire suppression systems such as sprinklers, smoke detection, fire alarms, and firewalls are typically non-existent until a building is near completion. Regardless of the material used, Prolonged exposure to fire without mitigation can lead to structural weakness and potential collapse. So that's where NFPA 241 comes from. The text was adopted by, 19, by NFPA in 1933 initially and 17 revisions, as I mentioned, primarily to make it as clear as possible as what needs to be done. Now, danger in a building under construction is exacerbated by the fact that we have portable and movable ignition sources. Both Ryan Gott and Rob talked about welding, grinding, soldering, all those kinds of hot work issues that ignite fires. Buildings don't spontaneously combust. There has to be an ignition source. Fires occur during construction process are most often attributable to human error or lack of understanding or lack of training. Ignition sources include, but aren't limited to, temporary heaters, welding, cutting, grinding, soldering, and roofing of various kinds. These ignition sources aren't permanent. They're brought on the site and into the building by people. They may only be there for a day or two. But one mistake in safety procedures for using them can destroy the building. And it can spread to other buildings, as we've seen in the examples that Rob used. Such fires are apt to cause losses far beyond the actual physical property destroyed by delaying completion of the buildings, with consequent loss of revenue, jobs, and all kinds of things. Important business projects contingent upon occupancy of a structure by a given date may thus be seriously delayed, even by a fire causing a relatively small direct loss. All of these issues are a concern that people be aware of, but it's impossible to physically train every worker that's going to be on that job as to their own safety procedures let alone all the safety procedures that are required by other trades around them. Now, in 1933, the city of New York had 138 construction fires. 
is the statistics. 37 from salamanders, 31 of them were unknown, and the percentages. Percentages haven't changed much. Today, nationally, salamanders cause 31% of construction fires. Settling torches, 28%. Electrical, 13%, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the, the sections of NFPA 241 haven't changed all that much in 80 years. The original document was 12 pages with no references. Today's 2013 edition has 21 pages and 19 mandatory references. Again, much of that is because we are learning what needs to be checked and regulated during construction. Now, the keys to success are a fire prevention program manager. There is no way that municipal inspectors have enough manpower to inspect jobs on an ongoing daily basis. As I said, what's good at 8 o'clock in the morning may not be by 5 o'clock that afternoon. Needs to be constant checking by the fire prevention program manager. That fire prevention program manager who is hired and appointed by the building owner has the authority to go work with the fire department on pre-fire plans and whenever though that fire program manager sees that the site has changed enough that they need to change that program, he or she's responsible to go back and work with the fire department to modify that fire plan. And the third key to success is constant vigilance. Extinguishers need to be in the required places at the right time. Some of the stuff needs to be inspected daily. Some of it needs to be inspected multiple times a day if you're going to do the job right. So using NFP 241 is kind of out of order if you're going to read through it. For example, chapters 7 and 8 are administrative in nature and should be read and understood first before you go through the rest of the document. Chapter 7 covers items that need to be in the fire protection program, and those things apply throughout the duration of the project. Chapter 8 on safeguarding construction and alteration operations covers items specifically related to passive and active fire protection that need to be installed in conjunction with the general construction as it proceeds, some of them floor by floor, some of them area by area. Then we go to chapter four. Now chapter four is temporary construction, equipment and storage. These are items that are not part of the final permitted project and will be removed before or shortly after the building is occupied. There are three categories, temporary offices and sheds, which are freestanding structures, temporary enclosures, which are materials attached to parts of the building or scaffolding, etc and equipment covering equipment exhaust and refueling. Chapter five covers very specific operations that represent very likely ignition sources if not handled correctly and specific materials that are easily combustible, flammable, or explosive that are generated or used in the course of construction may not be for long, but again, they need to be recognized, they need to be inspected, they need to be correct. Uh, chapter six, which I skipped here, um, is covers utilities. While this is a very broad category, most utilities are permanently installed from the beginning as the construction goes on. Electrical is the major exception to that, and therefore, Temporary installations during construction need to be closely monitored as they can be damaged, cut, frayed, pinched, can cause shocks, can cause electrocution, and start fires. This chapter covers three areas, general safety of electrical, temporary wiring, and temporary lighting. These are things that because of the nature of a construction operation need to be checked on a regular basis, again, some of them daily. Now, chapter 9, as you may surmise from the length of the chapter, roofing has historically been a major cause of fires in buildings both under construction and during re-roofing operations. This is due both to the materials involved 
and the methods of fastening them together and to the roof itself. While some systems are glued or chemically adhered and sealed, the vast majority still use heat in one manner or another, including torches and open flames. Roofing operation for a building is generally a relatively short period in the construction schedule, but it must be watched constantly and the prevention and response to potential fires planned for well in advance. This is hot, messy, and dangerous work. Under those conditions, it can be easy for workers to forget all the safety and fire procedures that they need to follow. And that's all it takes is one slip to start a disastrous fire. Now, chapter 10 is safeguarding demolition operations. Now, it may seem counterintuitive, but demolition operations can sometimes be more dangerous and more susceptible to fires and to fires that are more difficult to fight once started than those situations during a construction operation. It may be easier to understand if we think of it as deconstruction. Systems that were put in place to provide life safety and fire protection are to be taken out of service and removed, but nowhere near as carefully as they were put in. Should a fire start, it may be difficult to get close to, to fight it. Structural integrity may make it far too dangerous to get crews close enough to effectively fight the fire. So prevention during demolition is the best tool. And again, that's constant supervision. And then lastly, chapter 11 is safeguarding underground operations. These are likely the most difficult operations to safeguard, even more so than in high-rise structures. Simply due to their location, fire program managers need to consider, in addition to the requirements of chapters 1 through 10, planning for very limited means and locations of egress, verification of who is still underground at all times, potential for flooding, detailed evacuation plans and drills, fire protection systems, and communication systems are even more critical than they are on high rise. Special electrical requirements for damp locations and any hazardous operations of materials, storage, equipment, and reversible ventilation systems with air sampling and testing before or after each shift to assure safety. Fire prevention program managers must have an in-depth knowledge and experience in a wide, wide variety of codes, standards, policies, and procedures in order to be effective in this area. Now, mentioned that 19 standards have been added to NFPA 241. And here's a list of standard for fire extinguishers, installation of sprinkler systems, installation of standpipes, handling of flammable and combustible liquids, standard for the installation of oil burning equipment, design and installation of oxygen fuel gas systems for welding, cutting, and allied processes. 51B that Guy so eloquently talked about, standard for fire protection during welding, cutting, and other hot work. 54 is the National Fuel Gas Code. Again, you've got gas going into a building. While it may not be portable, it may be. Liquid, um, 58 definitely can be with liquefied petroleum gas. 70E is the National Electrical Code, and 70 uh, 70 is the National Electrical Code. 70E is the standard for workplace practices. 80 is fire doors and openings where we need separation walls in the building. Life safety code for egresses. 130, fixed guideway transit and passenger rail systems. That can be for underground. 211 is chimneys. You may get involved with that with permanent heating equipment. You may get involved with that with temporary heating equipment. Um, 495 is the Explosive Materials Code, 701 the Methods of Fire Tests and Flame Propagation of Textiles and Films. That may be enclosures that are on scaffolding to keep heat in, to work on. 704 is Identification of Hazardous Materials for Emergency Response, and 1963 for Hose Connections as standpipes go up in the building and rise through. These are the codes and standards that the Fire Protection Program Manager under 241 needs to be knowledgeable and conversant in and in the process build his checklist for his inspections, whether they're monthly, 
weekly, daily, or multiple times a day. Marcy? All right. Yes. So let's go ahead and I will take it back and I've got a few housekeeping items for you. And let's see. I apologize. I'm, there we go. Um, so thank you again, gentlemen. They've done a great job. Um, our partner organization, Woodworks, provides wood project assistance and other resources. If you want to reach out to them, email help at woodworks.org or visit their website at woodworks.org project assistance. Um, you can also request assistance from them on our survey. Um, and certainly if you have other questions, um, when we go back uh, to, to Rob and Guy and Alan, they've got their uh, email and their information on there that you can get further information from them. And then our design professional membership, um, we've got uh, benefits there for you and the cost is actually at this point in time it's prorated so it's $75 for membership for the rest of the year. Um, and then code official connections benefits, um, that's for our uh, qualified code officials if you work for a government um, organization uh, or a third party so there are a lot of benefits there and then just to remember our follow-up uh, information here um, complete the survey for a chance to win a free publication there's going to be information about your certificate of completion and CEUs in this email note that the actual certificates will not be available um, immediately they'll be available within two weeks um, remember that you must be present for 90% of the webinar for today's 90 minute webinar that's one hour and 21 minutes so don't you know don't leave until 330 um, please join us again in, on August 17th for our next webinar on forced transfer around openings. If you have any other questions or want more information, just email us at education at awc.org or visit us on our website at www.awc.org. Um, and I think that's the, the gist, gist of my information. So we're going to go back to Buddy and our guests for some questions and answers. Thanks, Marcy. If you could hand that off to Rob, he's got a couple more slides to uh, talk about for oh, some additional sure. resources. And then, folks, stick around uh, for some Q&A here, uh, especially if you're looking to get your CEUs. You don't want to drop off uh, too early and end up short on time. So, Rob, why don't you take it and close us out there with some additional resources, and then we'll tee up some questions. Thank you, buddy, and Marcy, I really appreciate you uh, managing this webinar for us, and Alan and Guy, very informative stuff, and always a pleasure to work with our, our partners at NFPA. Uh, as promised, there are some additional resources if you want to get out there and take a look to try to uh, sustain your programs or enhance your programs. Uh, first of all, there's a website that the AWC actually has hosted for a number of years called Construction Fire Safety Practices. There's information here that's downloadable for free. Uh, at awc.org and or constructionfiresafetypractices.org as well. And there's material there for uh, the, the uh, owner, the contractor, the fire service. Uh, you'll see there's some information on this slide about fire safety manuals, site-specific fire safety plans, and so on and so forth. Also, if you have a few minutes, uh, if you do a, a, a typical web search and you get online, you'll find that OSHA, as well as many state worker safety organizations, have good health and safety plans, including fire prevention elements on, on their sites. Uh, the National Safety Council has some. And of course, you can always contact your local building or fire code official to uh, seek some help. I know they're more than willing to uh, be out there and help you to, uh, to deal with this problem. So they, they don't want to deal with the fires, just the way you don't want to deal with them either. So uh, with that, uh, this concludes the AIA Continuing Education course, and I think we'll take some questions at this time. Buddy? Okay. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Um, before we jump there, one question that came in was a, whether this will be available afterwards, and the answer is yes, this program has been recorded and will be available to stream from our website in the next week or so. So if you have folks that you know would be interested in seeing this, they can still earn continuing education credits uh, by viewing the video and answering quiz questions that we've 
developed uh, with the speakers. So Rob, I'm going to ask you this uh, first question. It, it deals with um, the IBC reference to the fire code. So section 3302 of the IBC references um, chapter 33 of the International Fire Code, and that's a recent addition to the IBC. So to what, what extent can a code official enforce provisions of the IFC um, if they don't specifically adopt the, uh, the IFC itself? Buddy, that's a great question, and I hate to give you this answer, but the answer is, quote, it depends, unquote. Uh, it really depends on what the state legislature and local code officials allow. Uh, a number of states adopt the IBC, but take out the Chapter 1 administrative scope uh, section of the IBC. That's where you would find that authority. If you take a look at that section in Chapter 32 that says reference the IFC, if you go back to Section 101.4 of the IBC, that's where you get that nexus or that link to be able to enforce the International Fire Code. If your state has taken that out of the code, though, uh, you're kind of on your own and going to have to probably rely on best practices. And as you've heard from, from both NFPA as well as what, what uh, we've offered today, there are plenty of examples of best practices out there uh, that you might use as a reference. Great. Thanks. Guy, I'm going to uh, ask you this next question, so if you want to unmute yourself. Um, what is the minimum time period for Firewatch to remain at the site once the hot work activity has ended? Thank you, buddy. That's a great question. Um, and, and we're not hearing you very clearly there, Guy. I don't, maybe your mic is up or something. Yep, so. I put my microphone too far up. Sorry. My bad. Um, that's a great question. Um, simple answer is the current requirement per, per NFPA 51B per OSHA, because OSHA uh, in its regulations adopts 51B, is 30 minutes. Now that's um, the minimum requirement. Uh, if you uh, caught one of Alan's slides uh, on 241, you would notice that uh, 241 actually defaults to a um, more uh, aggressive requirement. They require a minimum of two hours, that being based basically on the hazard assessment that I described, where because of the heat of the tar, because of the use of the open torch, because of the high probability for uh, extensive retention of heat after the job is over, um, they have decided based on incident data to go to a uh, default minimum of two hours. The other thing I will share is that the NFPA Committee on Hot Work responsible for our standard, um, just met about a month ago. <clears throat> and as part of the second draft stage, which is the second phase of our revision cycle process, they um, have proposed and are in the process of actually doing the, the letter balloting on that to move the 30 minutes to actually one hour. So it is likely that the next uh, edition of NFPA 51B will have a new requirement uh, minimum and that will be to establish one hour as the minimum um, hot work, uh, fire watch requirement. Okay. Thanks, Guy. Um, Rob, I'm going to pass one more back to you, but I think uh, others may have opinions as well. But there were several questions about the owner being uh, primarily responsible uh, for fire safety. Can you talk a little bit more about that and how he or she might uh, designate uh, someone, uh, you know, since the GC is typically kind of controlling the job site, how does that interaction work? Well, obviously the owner has the, uh, in, in the common parlance, the deep pockets and is underwriting the project to make sure that it survives till the day the certificate of occupancy is issued. So not only do they have the legal obligation, they certainly have a financial one as well. But they do have the authority under the fire code, and, and I believe under 241 as well, to designate that to a, a, a different person. And that person could be the general contractor. Uh, it could be a specialized fire watch or fire warden, uh, depending on the size of the project and the complexity of the project. So uh, the authority or the, the responsibility lies with the owner, but he or she can, can grant it to someone else in the program. Great. So... Guy or Alan, there have been a couple other questions that have come in. Uh, a couple of them I'm not uh, even familiar with the uh, 
terminology. Here's one. Is there any guidance for determining fire flow needed for buildings under construction? Either one of you understand, want to tackle that question? I this have is no Guy. Term means. Yeah, th yeah, this is Guy. Um, I'm not sure unless they're talking about um, something related to either the standpipe for host, host connections. Mm. If they're talking about the standpipe, then um, a, a, as a, if a standpipe were going to be installed and available and functional, then that's going to be covered by NFPA 14. Ah, okay. Yeah, that it must be capacity. Yeah, that sounds yep. right. Yeah, buddy, this is Rob, and if I may jump in here, they may be talking about the uh, fire flow requirements under the fire code for manual firefighting. And although there are about six different methods out there for calculating fire flow, ranging from the ISO through the National Fire Academy to uh, even the old Iowa method, uh, those methods are all for determining fire flow under buildings that are already are under or are completed and occupied. So I'm not aware of any that is out there. I've been doing a lot of study on this. Uh, I'm not aware of any that's out there that applies specifically to buildings under construction. Okay, great, great. Well, that's why we have you experts here to help tackle these questions. All right, let me toss this other one up. Uh, has NFPA ever discussed implications of water damage from accidental discharge and how that impacts fire safety? And again, this is Guy. I'm going to guess because I've looked at uh, a, through a few of the other questions. There appeared to be one um, talking about whether um, any of us were, uh, whether the codes were going to look at uh, potentially installing active sprinkler systems for buildings that are under construction. And obviously that would speak uh, to some of the, the um, incidents, the case studies that Rob um, re referenced. My observation there in terms of the protection of those systems, if you had them installed and functional and you're still doing a lot of the active construction, my experience in being in those job sites is that there's a lot of potential damage, which would then link to the question you just threw to us, uh, Buddy, and that is about um, accidental release and therefore water damage resulting from that. So I, I think that's one of those uh, trade-off scenarios that um, from a sprinkler design standpoint and installation standpoint, you're reluctant to have those systems be um, in place when a lot of still heavy duty construction work is going on because um, high probability for damaging them. And then there, therefore, if it's a wet system, um, high probability of release of unwanted water. Uh, and maybe Rob can comment there, or Alan, from your experience as a building inspector. Well, let me um, let me just tee up one more question because we are at the bottom of the hour, and um, so uh, this one is uh, during a site emergency and evacuation, either fire related or not. What are the requirements for the fire watch? or make safe procedures for active hot work areas? And again, this is Guy. Um, the scenario there is that the roles and responsibilities of the fire watch are pretty narrow in terms of their duties. So if we have an active site emergency, um, their one of their duties should be to make sure that the hot work that they're involved, so let's assume it ha it's independent of their activity, let's just make sure that the, they should notify the hot work operator to stop the work because there's an emergency someplace else. Um, if the emergency is as a result of their activity, then um, they have the responsibility as part of their roles and responsibilities to be able to have notification means, and that could be radio, it could be phone. It could be uh, in an existing operating building to go pull a manual uh, to pull a fire uh, alarm pull station. Uh, but if the questioner is asking, do they have a role in then becoming part of the response? Um, that uh, is not going to be the case because the limited extinguishing uh, capability that they're going to have in the form of a say a 20 pound multi-purpose dry chemical extinguisher, which is most typical in a lot of construction sites, that's not going to do them anything. That's for incipient stage fires alone. And um, their job is to 
make sure that the work that they were doing doesn't further contribute to further ignition sources, stop that work, and then um, make sure that they secure the area and and then wait for the, the real response team in that instance. So I, if I understand that question, that's that's really how that should play out. Great, great. Well, gentlemen, thank you. Uh, excellent presentations today. Uh, we have a few other questions that have come in that we're not going to have time to address here uh, on the webinar. What we'll do is get those to the experts, the speakers, and, and have them uh, respond uh, back to you folks. And thanks for being here today. We're going to wrap it up, and uh, we hope to see you again next month for one of our webinars. Have a great day.